Welcome to r slash my the jerk, where Karen puts OP $7,500 in debt. My ex-girlfriend opened two credit cards in my name, she ran up $7,500 in debt, and now her current boyfriend is threatening me. My ex and I broke up a little more than a year ago. We lived together for a couple of years, and I know she had access to my financial information. When we broke up, I moved out of the house that we were renting, and I thought I had taken everything that belonged to me. Back in February, while doing my taxes, I realized I couldn't find my folder with my previous year's tax returns anywhere. I assumed it got lost in the move and I didn't think much of it. Last Friday, I got served with a lawsuit for over $5,000 in a defaulted credit card. When I pulled my credit report, I saw that the card had been in default since May and there was another one that had been closed in June for about $2,500. I had no knowledge of either of these accounts so I immediately disputed them with all three credit bureaus. I spoke to someone regarding one of the cards and they told me that it was opened in January, well after I had moved out of the house. The cards had been sent to my old address. I received the statements for that card and about 80% of the purchases were from Nordstrom and Macy's, two of my ex's favorite stores. I'm pretty sure she opened the accounts and used my social security number from the old tax returns. I called my ex but she denied everything. Even when I told her that if she had anything shipped at the house using a stolen credit card, she'd eventually be found out. She flipped out, started screaming at me, and told me to never talk to her again. About 20 minutes later, I got a call from a blocked number. It was her boyfriend, threatening to make my life horrible unless I stopped harassing her by claiming that she stole my identity. He hung up, but it shook me up. I looked him up and I saw that he has serious felonies on his record, including aggravated arson and aggravated discharge of a firearm, in addition to some battery charges. I'm in a tough spot. I risk retaliation if I pursue this, especially from someone with such a dangerous history. But I also can't just sit back and do nothing. I would greatly appreciate any advice. This is for every identity theft situation where you know the person. Here's the info you need. 1. Call the police. You're a victim of identity theft. It doesn't matter who did it or what your relationship is to them. They broke the law and now they must face the consequences. 2. Freeze your credit. Prevent this from happening again by freezing it. 3. Monitor your credit. You need to be alerted if anyone tries to open a new line of credit in your name. This can be done for free and it shows your credit score. 4. Warn others who might be affected. This includes family members of anyone else whose social security number could be compromised. And 5. Take the police report to the credit bureaus. When you dispute the accounts, give them the police report number. That should be enough to remove the accounts from your credit. It's on the creditors to prove the accounts are legitimate and a police report goes a long way towards clearing up your credit. Update one month later. I followed the advice in the comments and I went to the police. The process was quick and painless. I was in and out in about 30 minutes with a report number. I haven't received any more phone calls from my ex or her boyfriend. I provided the report number to the credit card companies and the credit bureaus. I was told that I don't have to do anything else except show up for the court date regarding the lawsuit. Today, I learned through a mutual friend that my ex was arrested this morning. Apparently, the county issued a warrant for her last week and she was pulled over on her way to work. It looks like she was charged but released quickly. I also found out that my ex and her boyfriend, the one who threatened me, are no longer together. I don't think I have to worry about him anymore. The court date for the lawsuit is later this month, but everything has already been removed from my credit report and my score has jumped up by almost 200 points. I'm still planning to attend the court date to ensure everything is cleared up, but so far, it's all good news from here. Am I the jerk for making my daughter pay for her own college testing and applications because she was caught cheating? I received a call to pick up my daughter, Lily, because she had been caught cheating on her practice SAT. After arriving, I learned that Lily's friend, Sam, had also been caught cheating. Her score was canceled, but thankfully, Lily will still be allowed to retake the test, and this has not gone on any kind of record. When I talked to Lily about what happened, she told me that Sam's mother was going to punish Sam if she didn't earn an exceptionally high score. In turn, Sam had pressured my daughter to help her cheat. I felt for a long time that Sam is not a genuine friend to Lily and has been trying to hold my daughter back to feel better about her own poor choices. I had spoken to Lily about this before and warned her not to let Sam manipulate her into doing anything she knows is wrong. Lily told me she understood, yet she still did this. I told Lily that, to prove she will take her education seriously from now on, she will need to come up with the fee for her future tests and college applications on her own. I suggested she start working odd jobs, such as babysitting or dog walking for the neighbors, to save up early. Despite telling me she understood, 
The time to register for the next test is approaching, and my daughter asked me to pay because she's short on cash and her school will not offer the test again until spring. She brought up the original excuse that Sam pressured her into cheating. I told my daughter no. I'm not going back on my word and she will learn to treat these opportunities with respect once she has to earn them herself. I also told Lily that she needs to stop letting Sam manipulate her and if she can't stand up to her, then maybe she doesn't have the mental maturity for college. Our extended family got involved in the disagreement and insisted that we cover the fee because it's for her education and it's important for college. I'm not allowing them to cover the fee for Lily because it undermines my lesson. Inevitably, someone pretending to be her friend will pressure her to cheat again in college. When she gets caught again, I'll end up losing thousands of dollars and Lily will lose her shot at a good education. Her college journey won't last long unless she learns responsibility now. Even though she spent her money poorly and doesn't have enough now, she will be able to wait and test in the spring, even if it's a less convenient time for her. Am I the jerk for putting my foot down with Lily and our family? Edit to answer comments. Lily is now a junior in high school. Taking the test in spring will not delay her college applications. If she takes the test in spring or even decides to retry during the summer, her score will still be available for her to use by the time fall applications roll around. I've also broken down the math in multiple comments already. Lily had and still has ample time and opportunity to save up. If she spends her money wisely this time, she will have more than enough to cover the fees, especially since these are the only expenses she will need to cover. Not the jerk. I get that it's hard to see your kids struggle, but sticking to your decision is probably the right move. She messed up, and paying for her own tests might actually teach her something about responsibility and consequences. If you give in now, she might not learn the lesson you're trying to teach her. It's tough, but she'll benefit in the long run from understanding the value of hard work and making better choices. Am I the jerk for refusing to give up my bedroom to visiting family members? I'm a 30-year-old single woman, and in a few weeks, I'll be moving to a new city in a different state for work. I'll be living in a small, one-bedroom apartment. A little over a week ago, my older brother, his wife, and I made a trip to Ikea to check out some sofas. I was looking for a lightweight sofa for my new apartment, something that could be easily dismantled and moved around by myself. I found a sofa that fit the bill, and both my brother and his wife agreed it was a good choice. They suggested I order it online and have it delivered. A couple of days later, while discussing my move with my brother, he said, You better buy a pull-out sofa for when we come to visit. I was surprised. I told him that I had already decided on the sofa we saw at Ikea, but I would make it up nicely and also get a sleeper mat to put in the living room for them. My brother got offended and said, No, if we're coming to visit, you should either have a pull-out sleeper sofa or give up the bedroom. I was upset. I told him it was unreasonable to make demands about what furniture I should buy or where I should sleep in my own apartment. We started arguing. He told me it made no sense for a couple to sleep in the living room of a one-bedroom apartment and that I shouldn't be so attached to my bedroom. I told him that I'm not the type of person to visit someone's home, whether a friend or family member, and make demands about sleeping arrangements. The argument got heated. He called me an absolutist and said I put too much emphasis on my own comfort and accused me of not being considerate of the fact that he's married. I told him I felt like I was being penalized for being single. I already deal with family members who are condescending to me. They don't see me as an adult woman deserving of respect, so I'm always expected to make compromises and be the peacekeeper. After nearly an hour of arguing, we apologized to each other. We're really close and neither of us likes to fight. In the end, we resolved that if my brother visits by himself, he'll sleep on the sofa, but if he comes with his wife, they'll stay elsewhere. I also told him I would look into sleeper sofas since I hadn't placed my IKEA order yet, and I respected that he and his wife may choose not to stay with me when they visit. Truthfully, I still feel hurt. Even though we resolve the argument, I'm left wondering if I'm truly being selfish and unreasonable. There's logic in giving a couple the bedroom, but I'm also tired of always having to compromise. Edit. I do not live with my brother. I live on my own. We currently live about 15 minutes away from each other and we see each other all the time. However, for my new job, I'll be moving 6 hours away. I realize how ridiculous it is to argue over hypotheticals and a sofa, but we're Asian American and we grew up with emotionally immature parents. We were used to walking on eggshells, so we both developed this habit of gaming out every possible scenario. There's definitely emotional baggage behind this conversation. As the single daughter, I've become the default caregiver for our boomer parents who didn't prepare for retirement properly. They often stay with me, sometimes for months at a time. They do not stay with my brother because they don't like his wife. This will likely change now that I'm moving. 
My brother and I try to support our parents financially and emotionally. We've always been close, probably because we dealt with our parents' dysfunction from an early age. As adults, my brother is better at maintaining emotional boundaries with them, whereas I struggle with asserting my own independence. I feel a lot of guilt. Overall, my brother is really supportive of me, but he can be obstinate and doesn't always see how difficult it is to be the daughter in our family or how often I make compromises for everyone else. This out-of-state move will definitely be a new chapter for all of us. Not the jerk. It's ridiculous to place demands on other people's homes based on hypotheticals, and even more ridiculous to demand someone give up their own bedroom to accommodate a couple. If they'd like to be treated like paying hotel guests, there are facilities elsewhere for that. I made my brother and sister-in-law temporarily homeless over a joke, and I don't regret it. I, 36 male, am a single father to two kids, Gabriel, who's 17, and Becky, who's 14. Their mother, my wife, passed eight years ago after a long illness. Obviously, this was devastating for our family, and we're still recovering from the loss even now. I haven't remarried or even seriously dated since my wife's passing, as I don't think I'll ever love anyone like I did her. I miss her dearly, but I am content being single if she's not around. Also relevant to this post, the house we live in originally belonged to my wife's grandfather. She inherited it when he passed, and then she left it to me in her will. It's a nice house and quite large, with five bedrooms and a decent amount of land as well. I have a younger half-brother, James, who's 30. We share a father, but have different mothers. To be honest, we've never been particularly close. Not to get too into irrelevant details, but our upbringings and our respective relationships with our father are very different, and it's always been a source of tension between us. At the end of last year, James suffered a series of severe misfortunes. The company he worked for went under, and he ended up losing his job. Since he works in a specialized and competitive field, he had a hard time finding another one. He was the sole earner for his family, so that was a huge blow. Several weeks later, they experienced a house fire, leaving them homeless and destroying many of their belongings. Despite not being close, I didn't want to see my family suffer like this. Since I had the space, I offered for James and his family to come stay with us until they could get back on their feet. So our household became me, my two kids, James, his wife, Laura, who's 31, and their twin daughters, Abby and Sarah, who are both nine. It became apparent shortly after they moved in that we have very different lifestyles and perspectives. James and Laura consider themselves a traditional couple, where James is the sole earner and Laura stays home to care for the house and kids. This is how they are raising their daughters. Let me be clear, if that's what works for them, that's fine, but it's not how I run my household. My kids are both taught to do housework and I've always encouraged them to pursue whatever careers they want. I knew about our lifestyle differences before they moved in, but I didn't anticipate it becoming an issue. However, about a month in, I noticed that James and Laura were trying to push their ways onto my family. For example, when it was Gabriel's turn to do the dishes, Laura would tell him he shouldn't be doing that and ask one of her daughters to do it instead. She even suggested Becky take over. I also noticed James would ask Becky to do things he could easily do himself, like getting him a drink or cleaning up his mess. I shut this behavior down when I saw it and eventually set James and Laura down to talk. I told them that they're welcome to live how they want in their own home, but in my house, we do things a certain way, and I would appreciate it if they respected that. They tried to push back a bit, but I held firm, and they eventually relented. For the next few months, things seemed fine. There were some instances where Gabriel and James butted heads over opinions, but nothing serious. Becky found Abby and Sarah a bit annoying because they always wanted to be in her room, but this was typical teenage stuff. In late July, James finally found a new job in his field, and they began the process of finding their own place. Everything seemed to be going well. However, around this time, I noticed a shift in Gabriel's behavior around Laura. He seemed uncomfortable, avoiding being alone with her, and didn't talk to her in a group setting. This was odd because he's usually laid back and friendly, so I asked if anything had happened. He said nothing had, just that she was being the way she is and it was getting on his nerves. I assumed she was pushing her ideas about men not doing domestic work again. I thought about saying something but decided to leave it since they'd be moving out soon. A few weeks later, when James and Laura were out for the day, Becky approached me with something important. She told me that Laura had said the reason I haven't remarried is because women my age don't want a man who isn't real and even joked that my wife was probably having an affair before she passed. Becky also said Laura told her I was jealous of James because he earned everything he had, while I just got the house as a handout. Laura even said she felt sorry for Gabriel because I was going to turn him into a wimp like me. 
I was furious, but wanted to talk to Gabriel first to see if anything was said to him too. Gabriel told me that Laura had made the same jokes to him and had even offered to hire someone to help him become a man for his 18th birthday. When Gabriel told her that he wasn't interested, she laughed and said he had learned to be. When James and Laura got back, I confronted Laura about this. She didn't deny it, just laughed and said that it was all a joke and I needed to lighten up. I told her that not only did I not find it funny, but she was no longer welcome in my home if she was going to talk to my kids that way. I demanded either a sincere apology or for her to leave that night. They were outraged and kept telling me to lighten up. I held firm, saying I had no issue with James and the kids staying, but I didn't want Laura in my house anymore. That night, they packed their stuff and went to an Airbnb, where they stayed until they found their own place. Our family is split on this. Our father is taking James' side, not surprising, but James' mother reached out to me saying she understood why I was upset, though she thinks I overreacted. James and Laura have been dramatizing this story, telling people I threw them out for no reason, so a lot of their friends see me as the bad guy. I know I did what was right for my kids, but it's taking a toll, and I just want it to be over. Am I the jerk for telling my friend that I'm sorry her parents don't love her as much as mine love me? I, 22 female, have a friend named Amy who's also 22 who I met in college. Currently, we're in our last semester. I live alone, but she shares her apartment with two other people. We never really spoke much about our finances, but I know both of our parents pay our rent. The issue started when we were talking about our future plans. I told her that I'm probably going to get a job and pursue my master's at the same time so I can save up a little and finally have my own money to spend on things I love, like traveling. She laughed and asked what kind of salary I expect to afford all of that while working part-time. I shrugged and said I didn't have many expenses to cover, just food. She looked shocked and asked about rent and other stuff, and I said my parents would continue paying for that. She then went on a rant about becoming an adult, how she can't wait to be independent, and how she doesn't want to take money from her parents anymore. I mostly nodded and tried to listen, but then she said something like, I'd feel like a bad daughter if I were you. That really made me feel embarrassed. My parents want to pay for my apartment. They can easily afford it and I'm grateful for it. I spend a lot of time with them and I know they're financially comfortable. They travel, own their home, and have a solid retirement plan. They don't mind paying for me and I don't mind accepting it. We have a good relationship. I know this arrangement won't last forever and I don't expect it to. It's just for a few years until I finish my degree and secure a better paying job. I got annoyed and told her to drop the topic, suggesting we talk about something else, but she kept going on about how her parents want her to be a real adult, how I won't be ambitious unless I struggle, and just kept making comments like that. Not sure how relevant it is, but between the two of us, my grades are significantly better, and I'm ahead of her in terms of passing exams this semester. Finally, I cut her off and said, Well, I don't know. Maybe my parents love me more than yours love you, so they want to pay. I'm sorry for that. Can we talk about something else now? We haven't spoken since, and I feel bad. I know love has nothing to do with money, and looking back, it was a rude thing to say. I just said it to shut her up, because she was insulting me and calling me spoiled for no reason. I wasn't even the one to start the conversation or pry into her finances. She kept pushing the topic. Ever since that day, I've had this pit in my stomach. I didn't mean to insult her. Everyone sucks here. You're definitely a jerk for saying such a thing. Money does not equal love, ever. That said, she was a jerk for not dropping the subject earlier and trying to make you feel like you were taking advantage of your parents. Both of you have loving parents. They may not have the same amount of money, but besides that, they can have different ideas about the best ways to support your careers and lives. In this case, since you do have better grades, you are perhaps a better candidate for a master's program, which in the long run will make continuing to support you a good investment. She may want to continue her education, but her parents have decided they will not support her past her bachelor's. That doesn't mean they don't love her as much. They may have limited funds, or they may rightly believe that she's not a good candidate for an advanced degree. But you have to see that she is trying to reconcile her situation and yours without thinking her parents don't love her. Certainly, there are students who want to stay in college at their parents' expense for as long as possible and avoid having to take care of themselves financially. I don't think that applies to either of you. Petty Revenge on the Neighborhood Lawn Police My husband, 53 male, and I, 52 female, bought our first house 13 years ago and quickly realized we were the black sheep of the neighborhood. We live in a quiet cul-de-sac in the middle of town, a neighborhood we never even knew existed until we started looking for homes to buy. Our neighbors are about 10 to 20 years older than us and keep their yards in unsustainably perfect conditions. 
It seems like they either hire lawn services or are retired and have nothing better to do than yard work 24-7, rain or shine. The neighbors on both sides of us and across the street are the latter. One neighbor uses a leaf vacuum to remove leaves from his yard and the street multiple times a day. If it's storming, he'll stand in his garage with his door open and rush out during breaks in the rain to remove every last leaf. This guy has serious OCD about his lawn. He doesn't own a single tree, but he constantly complains to other neighbors about the sycamore tree in our front yard. It not only peels its bark year-round, but also drops its leaves very early in the season. We don't rake our leaves because they serve as a great natural fertilizer, but we do pick up large branches and bark before mowing. Not long after we purchased the house, I became disabled and could no longer do heavy yard work. My husband kept it up until he became disabled during lockdown and couldn't handle the heavy lifting either. Our funds are very limited now, so we hired a kid to mow for us at a cheap rate. When school resumed in person classes after lockdown was under control, he stopped working for us and we had to rely on family for help. They can only assist a couple of times a month at most, which is apparently unacceptable to our neighbors. If our grass is even slightly over six inches, they call the city code enforcement office to report us. I've gotten to know the woman who fields the calls very well over the past couple of years. She agrees that the reports are excessive, but she's still required to follow up and contact us. Many of the complaints are civil issues, like a tree being too close to a fence, but grass height is one we must comply with. If we've had a lot of rain, like this year, our lawn grows faster and our family may not be able to come into town right away to help. The neighbors have never once spoken to us about the situation or asked why our lawn care routine has changed. In fact, we haven't spoken to any of these problem neighbors in over five years. Instead, they keep reporting us over and over. The city understands and gives us a month to address the issue each time and we always do, but it's absolutely ridiculous. One day, we decided we were done trying to be nice neighbors and fit in with the golf course lawn crowd, so we got petty. We called the city to get the property line tagged and asked for a copy of the city code to see what you can and can't put in your lawn. Pink flamingos were not on the list. We now have 20 large pink flamingos placed a few inches on our side of the property line all along the sidewalk. There's not a thing they can do about it and it definitely gave the city officials a good laugh. We still have to keep the grass under 6 inches but it just feels different now. My Karen girlfriend is demanding that I marry her. I'm 30, male. I've been with my girlfriend, who's also 30, for a year and a half. We live together in a house that I bought alone. Honestly, she's an amazing person. She's extremely caring, thoughtful, and beautiful. However, we see life very, very differently. With money, for instance, I make more than double her income, and because of this, I pay the vast majority of the bills, which I'm honestly fine with. She helps out with groceries and some bills, and it works. The problem is that she has lots of disposable income, and she treats it as such. She never has money for the things that she needs. Her car has problems. She needs to borrow money from me. She wants to go on vacation. She racks up massive credit card bills. She generally owes me between one and $4,000 at any given time, and when she starts paying me back, she inevitably needs to borrow more at some point. She literally spends it all on useless crap, constantly replacing our dishes, for example. She's extremely difficult to communicate with and reacts very harshly to things that make no sense to me. For example, I was engaged before we got together. She knew this. I've had junk mail show up with my ex's name on it and I got absolutely blasted from her. She threatens to pack up and leave because of things like this and I don't think I have control over them. And she will not explain why she gets so mad about it. Lots of things like this have been building up. Recently, the straw that broke the camel's back and destroyed my spark for her happened. She talked about marriage, having kids, etc. I asked her why she wants to get married, and she said, because she wants to throw a party. This seemed wildly inappropriate and a weak reason to make such a strong commitment. So I told her I'm not ready to marry her because of the reasons above and similar things that aren't mentioned for length purposes. She lost her mind, cried, said she was going to pick up, said that things are not salvageable then changed her mind and wants to work it out now. Am I the jerk? Why are there so many posts like this? OP, I love my partner. They're the most amazing, kind, caring, wonderful person ever. Also OP, they financially and emotionally mistreat me constantly. They stomp my reasonable boundaries and punish me for complete non-issues or just being myself. They tend to out themselves as being irrationally jealous and controlling, selfish, unstable, and constitutionally unempathetic during any sort of hard discussion. There's no way to communicate with them at all when they're upset. 
Why would you stay with this person if they treat you as you describe, let alone ask if you're the jerk for not marrying them on a whim? The reason she saw a wedding as just a party shows that she doesn't think of you as a person she wants to commit to and build a life with. She thinks of you as someone who is never going to leave her anyway and is great for funding a lavish party. She clearly was trying to manipulate you. Then when it didn't seem to be getting the results she wanted, switch tactics. She knows what she has in you and of course doesn't want to leave the very cushy life that you give her. At least not until she's locked down what she thinks would be a better prospect. My brother proposed to my fiancé, his ex, and I'm ticked off. I'm 28, male. My brother, Mark, used to date my fiancé, Jen, who's 26, a year ago. For context, they dated back in August of 2022. They were only together for a month before he broke things off with her because he was bored of being in a relationship and never really wanted to settle down anyway. At the time they were dating, I was in a different state, so I had no idea he even had a girlfriend, and I had no idea who Jen was until I met her. Jen and I met at a bar when I moved back in October and we hit it off really well. She was easily the most beautiful and intelligent woman I've ever met and we met up a few times before we made it official. Fast forward to December, I finally bring her up to my family and suggest they meet her at Christmas. They knew that I was in a relationship but I'm not the most open about my personal life so I kept details about her to a minimum until I knew how serious we really were. My parents asked to see pictures and they started passing my phone around the dinner table Mark saw it and he blew up, calling me a bad brother for dating his ex-girlfriend and he demanded that I break it off with her. I refused. When I asked Jen about it, she confirmed they dated and gave me the details about their breakup. It took a few weeks, but eventually Mark stopped bringing up me dating his ex and I thought he was over it. On Jen's birthday this year, I took her out to a fancy dinner with both of our families and her closest friends and I asked her to marry me. Mark flipped once again and blew up about me proposing to her which I and my sisters immediately shut down. The incident happened this past weekend. Mark has been pretty quiet about the whole thing for the last two months. I didn't see him much and figured he went low contact with me, which I had no problem with. Then he invited me and Jen for a family dinner at his apartment with my parents and sisters. I thought it was weird, but my parents and sisters were also going, so we agreed to go. The dinner was nice, nothing too fancy, and we moved to the living room to talk. After 30 minutes into normal conversation, Mark stood up and told us he had an announcement. He made a long speech about being happy to have his family around for his big moment, then he got on one knee and pulled out this cheap ring while asking Jen to marry him. Jen was confused and obviously uncomfortable and demanded that he put it away and stand up. My dad tried to make a grab for Mark, but I got to him first and I bopped him. I won't repeat most of what was said, mostly because I was too angry to even listen to most of it but he said something along the lines of wanting to show me that Jen wasn't really into me and just wanted to get back at him. Before it could get worse, my parents rushed me out and promised to talk to him. It's been a few days since it happened and I'm still ticked off. I don't know what to do at this point. I'm scared Jen might have second thoughts marrying me because of this. Any advice? I want to clarify a few things that I saw in the comments. 1. Jen and I are newly engaged. It was one of those feelings where we both knew we were in it for the long run. As far as it is, I'm sure about her. 2. When we met, I was the one who approached her, not the other way around. Whether she knew or had suspicions of us being related, I don't know. I asked after finding out they dated and she says she had no idea. I didn't have a reason to doubt that, but I can admit this seemingly overreaction on Mark's part does raise red flags. 3. I had no idea she and Mark dated when I met her. Mark and I aren't close at all. We used to be, but as we grew up, we drifted apart and talked less and less. Before I moved back, we didn't really speak much aside from special days like his or my birthday. Jen knew of my family, but not much until I decided I was ready to introduce them to her. When she and Mark met again, I didn't get a sense of any residual feelings on either part. She didn't treat him like a stranger, but she also wasn't overly affectionate with him either. I was told this was a relationship that lasted a month. I didn't think I needed permission from Mark to ask her to marry me but maybe that was wrong of me. I'm not sure. That being said, I plan to talk to Mark this weekend to lay everything out on the table and figure out what's up. I never asked for his side of their relationship, which is my fault for not doing my due diligence. If anything major or enlightening happens, I'll update. But for now, that's all I have. Update. I called Mark and asked him to meet up with me at my place to talk. I told him I would prefer Jen to be around for the talk as well, but I was cool with it if he didn't want her there. He agreed to talk to the both of us and showed up at my place around noon today. It was pretty quiet for a few minutes before I started the conversation. 
I apologized for not warning him I would be proposing to Jin, and I apologized for hitting him. He said it was whatever, but he appreciated the apology. I told him what Jin had said about the relationship and breakup when I asked her about it, and I asked him to confirm if that was true. I pretty much said that his reaction throughout the whole thing has been extreme and I wanted to make sure I wasn't misunderstanding their relationship or downplaying how serious they were. He confirmed that they only dated for a few weeks and he broke up with her because he lost interest. Jen asked if he was acting like this because he still had feelings or regrets about ending things with her. He said he could admit he thought she was more attractive than when he last saw her but there weren't any feelings or regrets. He said he just didn't like seeing a girl he dated even if it was short term with his older brother and as a man, I shouldn't have violated him by pursuing things with his ex. I reminded him that I had no idea they dated, so it wasn't like I consciously did this knowing their history together. He shrugged me off and said it didn't matter. I still should have broken it off. He was adamant that if the roles were reversed, he would have done the same thing, which I doubt. I asked him why he proposed to her if he didn't have any lingering feelings. Basically, to sum it up, he was talking about it to one of his buddies who was around when Mark and Jen dated and the guy put the idea in his head that maybe Jen knew from the start that we were related and was doing this to get back at him, considering Jen had been hung up on him after they ended it. He and his friend thought it would be a good idea to test it and see if they were right, so he came up with the idea to propose and see if she would dump me for him. Jen asked him to elaborate on why he thought she was hung up on him, and he told her that he had heard she was asking about him following the breakup and still hanging out at the places they used to go, so it was a valid assumption. Then for her to pop up randomly with his brother affirmed his suspicions. Jen told him she had only asked about him once following the breakup and she had been hanging out at those places with friends before they started dating and she wouldn't avoid them because of a breakup. She also told him she was offended at the idea that she would go as low as to pursue me just to get back at him. He shrugged and gave her a weak apology but said that she had to see it from his point of view. He asked her if she really didn't know and she told him that she didn't see the resemblance in us until we were in the same room and we act nothing alike, so it never crossed her mind, and he said okay. That pretty much wrapped up the conversation. He did tell me before he left that I could take back his invite to the wedding because he can't bring himself to support our relationship knowing he used to date her. I told him he didn't have to worry about that as he was most likely not going to be invited anyway. It's been a few hours since our talk, and I do feel better. My parents aren't too happy about him being uninvited, but they understand that it was a mutual decision and probably for the best. My sisters told me they knew he didn't have a good reason for being a jerk and they don't blame me for not wanting him at the wedding. As of now, I'm going to limit contact with Mark and I doubt he'll reach out to me anytime soon either. Do this next. Tap here on your screen to come see our new podcast playlist where you'll find thousands of hours of the best stories you've ever heard. Or tap the one on the right. That episode is specifically just for you based on other videos you've enjoyed the most.